It gives me great pleasure to introduce Ambassador Johnson. Daryl Johnson became the Deputy Coordinator for Assistance to the new independent states of the former Soviet Union in May of 1994. He is a career Foreign Service officer who brings to this position extensive experience in East European and Asian affairs. Ambassador Johnson served as the first American ambassador to the Republic of Lithuania, having arrived in Vilnius in September 1991 to open the first post-war U.S. mission in that country. Before that, he served as Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Warsaw, Poland, and before that in Beijing, and in Moscow, and in Hong Kong, and, and in Bombay, India. In addition, he served in the Department of State in Washington as Officer in Charge of Yugoslav Affairs, Officer in Charge of the People's Republic of China Affairs, as well. As a Pearson Fellow in the office of Senator Claiborne Pell and as Special Assistant to the Undersecretary for Political Affairs, in the latter position, his responsibilities included East European, Soviet, and East Asian Pacific Affairs during the tenure of then Undersecretary Lawrence Eagleburger. Mr. Johnson was born in Chicago, Illinois in 1938 and he grew up in suburban Seattle, Washington. He attended public schools there, graduating in 1956, and went on to attend the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma and the University of Washington in Seattle, from which he received his BA in English Literature in 1960. Following graduation, he attended the University of Minnesota and Princeton University and worked for several months at the Boeing Company in Seattle during and after his university studies. He served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Thailand before joining the Foreign Services, the Foreign Service. His languages are Chinese, Polish, Russian, Thai, and Lith Lithuanian. And on behalf of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ambassador Johnson. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Abramson. Sometimes it's fun to reminisce about all those past times and past places. I'm especially pleased to have a chance to be with you in Baltimore this afternoon. I've been to Baltimore many times. This is one of the few that I was not on my way to attend a ball game. Um, I uh, confess to being a devoted, devoted Orioles fan. Uh, but I also have to say that I am disgusted about this strike, and I hope that the sooner it's over, the better. <laughs> I want to see Cal get that record soon. December 7th is a day in infamy 53 years ago. President Roosevelt so described it. Of course, it was December 8th in Japan. Uh, they sometimes wonder why we mark December 7th as the date. You will have an opportunity later today to the privilege and opportunity of hearing Ambassador Winston Lord address U.S. policy on Asia. Ambassador Lord was my boss in Beijing during a part of my time there and is one of the most brilliant American diplomats of his generation. Uh, you've already had a chance to hear Ambassador Dobbins uh, discuss Haiti this afternoon. And I'm here to tell you about assistance to Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Armenia, and their neighbors. And I'm going to try to tell you or try to convince you that it is a good investment for the United States and that it is good for U.S. taxpayers. Why? First, because such cooperation, such partnership makes the world a less dangerous place. It's less dangerous than confrontation and considerably less expensive. Secondly, it shows the best of America, promoting democracy and the rule of law, strengthening free market economics, helping sick children and well students, promoting U.S. trade and investment. Third, it's working. Unevenly, to be sure, but the scene is much more encouraging than it was last December, just a year ago, when Vladimir Zhirinovsky's so-called Liberal Democratic Party won a fourth of the votes in the elections for Russia's parliament. Russia has changed a lot 
in just one year, mostly for the better. Ukraine has taken major steps since President Kuchma was elected this past summer. Kyrgyzstan and Moldova have strong economic reform programs, and some of the other countries look like they're moving towards serious reform. Our goal is to encourage peace, stability, and prosperity in a region which has not enjoyed enough of any of these three qualities. And our programs, which have enjoyed broad bipartisan support in the Congress, are helping to make a difference in the lives of real people. Five years ago, the East European Revolution was playing itself out. Poland had held the first free elections in the communist world in June of 1989. The Velvet Revolution in Prague continued during that summer. The Berlin Wall fell to loud cheering in November. And the Ceausescu's came to their end in December. The decay within the former Soviet Union began to show at the same time, although it's now clear that it started much earlier. I commend to your viewing pleasure a four-part series on the history of the Cold War, War called Messengers from Moscow, which will be broadcast on the public broadcasting service for four consecutive evenings, four consecutive Friday evenings, an hour each, beginning on January 13th. The plug is uh, unsolicited, but it's definitely worthwhile for those of you who are as interested as you all are in public policy and foreign affairs. By the time of the coup attempt against Gorbachev in August 1991, it was clear that the Soviet Union was breaking up with the Baltic countries leading the way. I arrived in Vilnius, Lithuania on September 11th to establish the first post-war U.S. mission in that country. The USSR ceased to exist on Christmas Day 1991, and 12 new independent countries, including Russia, were born. Uh, by the way, we do not include the Baltic states among the new independent states of the former Soviet Union, because the United States never recognized that they were ever legitimately a part of the USSR. But sovereignty did not automatically bring with it a commitment to the principles of democracy or market economics. Most of the new leaders were products of the old system. And none of the new countries, except Russia, had any practice of governance. It is hardly surprising that economic chaos and social disorder, including crime, ethnic conflicts, and human rights problems, emerged from the rubble of the old Soviet state. It is more surprising that most of the countries have done as well as they have, especially given the wrenching changes that they are still going through. The American people responded to the end of the Cold War and the end of the Soviet Union with profound satisfaction and deep generosity towards the peoples of the former evil empire. This pattern was established with the emotional outpouring of support for the newly free Poland and its charismatic leader Lech Wałęsa following his address to a joint session of the Congress in November of 1989. In the case of the NIS countries, our first assistance programs, which mainly involved the delivery of humanitarian goods, that is food, medicines, heating fuel, began in 1992 under President Bush. But the program really took off in 1993 when President Clinton and congressional leaders of both parties passed a special one-time appropriation of nearly $2.5 billion for assistance to the NIS, the new independent states, for fiscal year 1994. That may sound like a lot of money, and it is. But it is a tiny fraction of the trillions of dollars we spent successfully confronting the Soviet Union over most of my lifetime and yours. That appropriations bill passed the U.S. Senate by a vote of 88 to 11. And it passed the House of Representatives by a vote of 309 to 111. It was signed into law by President Clinton on September 30, 1993. For fiscal year 95, the Congress appropriated $850 million, one-third of the 94 level. Uh, and we have begun to look at our 1996 needs, fiscal year 96 needs, but are not yet in a position to address uh, those numbers. While Russia was understandably the initial focus of our efforts, the program was not and is not Russo-centric. In the first uh, tranche that I mentioned earlier, roughly 65% of the fiscal 94 funds 
were directed at programs in Russia, while now 55 percent is directed at non-Russia programs. That's for fiscal 95. This pattern is likely to continue. What good have we done? At the most basic level of national security, we have tried to make the world safer. The control of nuclear weapons and nuclear materials remains an issue of fundamental importance to all Americans. The recent decision by the Ukrainian Rada, the Ukrainian Parliament, with the strong endorsement of President Kuchma to ratify the Non-Proliferation Treaty represented a major step in ridding the world of such weapons. Ukraine thus joined Belarus and Kazakhstan, which had already committed themselves to become non-nuclear states. Uh, similarly, the recent agreement between Kazakhstan, Russia, and the United States permitted the removal from Kazakhstan and the safe storage of a large quantity of weapons-grade material. In terms of geopolitics, all of the new independent states have joined the CSCE, that is the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, and NATO's Partnership for Peace. This program, this latter program, permits much more active engagement between NATO member states and those of the former Warsaw Pact. Regarding the formal expansion of NATO to include other countries, the United States and our NATO allies are committed to proceed, but without any prospective list of new members and without any timetable. It is clearly not in our interest or anyone else's to see new barriers grow to take the place of the Berlin Wall, to erect a new dividing line further to the east. We seek a Europe whole and free, and our policies are inclusive, not exclusive. In this regard, uh, uh, I would not attach a lot of importance to the public statements made by Russian leaders in recent days. Their concerns are clear, as are our efforts to deal with them in a manner which enhances the security of Russia's neighbors and of Russia itself. In this context, I also wanted to mention one aspect of this policy, this inclusive policy, in which I played a small part. In the summer of 1992, the Lithuanian and Russian defense ministers signed a troop withdrawal timetable. Over the next 12 months, uh, the Russians threatened on several occasions to halt the withdrawal for one reason or another. But in fact, the troops were all gone before midnight, August 31st, 1993. Over the following year, the Latvians and Estonians worked with the Russians to conclude withdrawal agreements, and President Clinton played an active personal role in moving this process to a successful conclusion. One tool in this process, undertaken at the strong urging of the Baltic leaders, was the officer resettlement program, under which the U.S. is providing vouchers or housing units for 5,000 of the Russian officers who are leaving Latvia and Estonia out of about 110,000 troops who were in the Baltics when I arrived. Let me reiterate one obvious point. The United States considers all of the new independent states to be sovereign and independent countries, and we deal with them accordingly. President Clinton recently hosted President Kuchma for a state visit, giving that relationship a significant boost. Earlier this fall, the president hosted uh, Russian President Yeltsin. These two visits, these two state visits, by the way, make up four of the state visits which so far have been held during this administration. The president and vice president have also visited most of the countries of the region. Vice President Gore will be going to Moscow next week uh, for the fourth session of what is called the gore chernomyrdin Commission, where he and the Russian prime minister meet to talk about a variety of programs, mostly in the energy and environmental area. Other U.S. leaders have met with the leaders of new independent states at the U.N., recently in Budapest, at the World Bank meetings in Madrid, and elsewhere. Our objective is to encourage the active integration of each of the new independent states into European and global institutions to help them play their legitimate role on the world stage. Turning to a different aspect of security, we have begun a program working with the Russians and the other NIS countries to combat crime. One vital part of fighting crime is establishing laws and practices which are fair and open. 
Our rule of law programs, which operate in virtually all of the NIS, uh, involve assistance with constitutional law, with contract law, with legal training, and of course with criminal law. Such institution building is a critical part of the transformation to democracy. On the humanitarian side, our program has saved lives. We have provided medical supplies to many places in the NIS and have encouraged private hospital partnerships which will continue even after official funding runs out. For example, we will soon be delivering a fully equipped trauma hospital decommissioned or demobilized uh, by our forces in Japan to Vladivostok. This transfer, valued at around five million U.S. dollars, will be partnered with a hospital in Richmond, Virginia, which will provide training and management for this facility. This, by the way, is typical of the strong role which is played in NIS assistance by private sector and by non-governmental organizations. We are still shipping food and fuel to Armenia and Georgia to help them get through another winter. But we are very hopeful that this will be the last winter in which they will need this kind of assistance. The ceasefire in the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh has permitted those countries to look beyond the immediate needs of their people <coughs> and to address the broader needs of their economies. We are helping Armenia and Georgia in this transition. And in this and other cases, we work closely with other donor countries and with international institutions. For example, the European Union, Japan, the World Bank, the IMF, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. In the field of economic restructuring, Kyrgyzstan and Moldova were the first to undertake bold reform programs to meet IMF guidelines, and we were there to help them. Russia has privatized over 70% of its formerly state-owned industries and has created 40 million shareholders, several times more than shareholders in the United States, and we helped to shape this program. Our Peace Corps volunteers and, required and retired business executives are working in several of the NIS to help small businesses get started or restructured. Our enterprise funds are making loans to new entrepreneurs in Russia and will soon be doing so in other countries. In the area of trade and investment, the Commerce Department has established several programs to assist U.S. business people who want to do business in the NIS. Commerce has also established American business centers in key cities in the region to help American business people on the ground. The U.S. Overseas Private Investment Corporation has provided $855 million to support 18 projects in the new independent states over the past year. The Trade and Development Agency has funded feasibility studies, which have led to more than $600 million in direct U.S. investment in the new independent states. And the Export-Import Bank has made available $1.2 billion to U.S. companies which are trying to sell goods and services in the NIS. About a week ago, I met with the new Russian Minister of Education who had spent a couple of days in Kansas talking with Russian students, two Russian students in particular, uh, who were studying in Kansas as high school students for a year. And he could not say enough good things about the warmth of the welcome, about the way the children had adapted to the families and vice versa. And he spoke also very warmly about uh, the reciprocal programs under which American students go to Russia. There are thousands of such stories now each year. And I recall um, during my time in Moscow back in the mid-70s, what is now called the period of stagnation. Didn't seem like stagnation at the time, but anyway, it is now. Um, one of our uh, people at the embassy suggested that we should have a program whereby the United States would pay for 10,000 Russians to come to the States and 10,000 Americans to go to Russia. And he said, if you do that, you'll end up with 20,000 converts. Uh, this is perhaps not quite the same equation. Obviously, part of the point is that people will learn here and take their skills back and help with the transformation there. That is what's happening. 
The process of change in the NIS continues. It is an uneven process, which has brought pain to many millions of people. But these countries are not so much underdeveloped as misdeveloped. And most of the freely elected governments have now chosen the reform path, either because they are really committed or because they see no realistic alternative. And we are there to help in the manner and to the degree that they wish. Most of our assistance takes the form of know-how, and most of it makes a real difference. The new independent states are very diverse and getting more so. The success of one does not mean the success of others. Their success or lack of it will depend primarily on their own policies. But success is possible, and it can be seen not far from the borders of the new independent states. Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, even the Baltic states. Soon the United States will be out of the aid business in these countries, and we should expect to be out of the NIS entirely by the end of this decade. But for now, we need patience and consistency. Peace, stability, and prosperity in the NIS are good for America. If I could ask people who have questions to please go to the microphones. And while we're waiting, I would take the liberty of asking the first question. Please. Vladimir Zirinovsky and his ilk, right. do we treat them as real threats as, or as aberrations? One of the most remarkable developments of the many remarkable developments over the past year is the degree to which the support for Zhirinovsky, as measured by opinion polls, has dropped. It is, I think, our firm conviction that the will of the people, wisely informed people, and honestly expressed will, uh, will um, expose frauds, if you like, will expose people who may be great um, chauvinists but are not going to be great political leaders. Uh, I saw a poll recently that suggested that Zhirinovsky's support in Russia now is something in the neighborhood of 4%. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect there's probably that much support for him in this country. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, in other words, I think that democracy, stability, prosperity, and so forth are the, are the absolute enemies of, of someone like Zhirinovsky. And I think that the success that I tried to outline, tentative as it may be, has already shown uh, that uh, he can be marginalized, he and folks of like mind. Thank you. Why don't we begin to my left? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, you mentioned briefly the um, crime situation yes. in Russia, and um, I plan to be traveling there and studying and working there for about nine months. Now, yes. when you refer to crime, is that more, is the problem more with organized crime, or is there a high level of street crime, and how cautious should American citizens be when they go to study and work there? I think, as a general rule of thumb, you should exercise the same kind of caution you would in any American city. As a matter of fact, <laughs> well, in other words, don't go out at night alone, uh, you know, or walk in places that are unlit and so forth. I mean, you exercise normal prudence. It is also true, however, that despite all of the, the many stories about the explosion of crime uh, in Russia and in the other uh, new independent states, it tends to be targeted. It tends not to be random. Uh, it tends to be, you know, settling of scores. Uh, it's again an anomaly, partly uh, the result of an abnormal economy. Uh, people can make money through uh, manipulating the, the supply of goods and services, and, uh, and there are lots of uh, potential gains and losses from these processes. So to the degree that rule of law works, uh, crime will also, I think, uh, be minimized. I would say, again, you know, exercise normal prudence. Uh, there have been very few cases of which, with which I am familiar where Americans have been specifically targeted. Okay. Thank you. Gentleman to my right. Uh, Ambassador, um, uh, um, Foreign Minister Kozadev's recent remarks um, yes. seem to rule out the possibility of Russia ever joining NATO. Now, obviously, he could not take exception if mm -hmm. Russia join, were to join the NATO alliance as a full member at the same time that the former satellites did. Have the Russians expressed interest in full-fledged membership in NATO, and or has the U.S. government discussed, uh, broached the, reached the possibility of their joining with them? 
the approach to the Partnership for Peace has the beauty of simplicity in that the rules are the same for everybody. You present your proposals, you take part in meetings and so forth. It's the same for Moldova as it is for Russia, or it's the same for Albania as it is for Ukraine, for example. I mean, it's, it, the rules are the same for everybody. So if you want to play in that game, and the Russians have indicated that they, or they did until a couple of days ago, indicated that they wanted to do so, uh, then the rules are the same. We have said, that is, the United States' position is that if Russia meets the criteria and it wants to become a member of NATO, they would be considered the same as anybody else. But the point of my formulation here, that is, that there has been no decision about who will be new NATO members or when this process would go forward, uh, is intended to avoid uh, sort of haves and haves nots, if you like, or the ins and the outs, or the almost ins and the not quite ins, uh, or something. So the idea is, as I tried to indicate, that we don't want to exclude Russia. We, if they want to exclude themselves, it's a different thing. Uh, but so far, uh, they haven't chosen to exclude themselves. Uh, they have simply kept the door open uh, and have, uh, in some cases, asked for special treatment, which NATO has not been willing to, to grant. So I think that's a long and not very necessarily very clear answer to your question. The answer is we have not, as far as I know, specifically discussed with Russia what they would have to do to become NATO members. We haven't discussed that with anybody uh, because there isn't any blueprint. So. Next, please. Uh, Nick, I think we have to take sir. Okay. How much money, if any, goes to republics like Kazakhstan to help monitor the security of, nucle of their nuclear weaponry? And um, how would economic prosperity lead to more efficient exercise of such security? Okay, good questions. Uh, first, I'm sure you're aware of the uh, recent agreement uh, between Kazakhstan, the United States, and Russia, under which the United States brought, brought back uh, several tons of, of um, highly enriched uranium, which had been stored in Kazakhstan for something like 20 years. It was not being stored very safely, it didn't seem to us, and it was actually Russian in origin, so there was kind of, you know, it had to be a th three-way thing. Our view was that getting the stuff out of there was worth something. Uh, now, the exact amount, there was never, despite what you read in the paper, there was never an exact quid pro quo that said, we're buying this stuff for X and here's the check. Uh, it wasn't that way. We have programs in Kazakhstan similar to the things that I described earlier. We have education programs, we have rule of law programs, we have energy efficiency programs, we have a lot of other things going on in Kazakhstan. Um, and those programs are continuing. Kazakhstan is a big country. Uh, how much of that can be specifically attributed to this transaction? I don't know. Maybe there is a number. I don't know what it is. Uh, I think the White House spokesman was quoted as saying in the low tens of millions. Uh, but that describes basically the whole program. The low tens of millions is what we have in our budget for 95. So uh, it's not a, a, a very clear picture from that standpoint. As far as the other question of how does rule of law, how does economic reform and so forth facilitate uh, this, the security of nuclear materials, uh, it's a question of responsible government. Uh, I mean, Kazakhstan has uh, exercise responsibility in a number of ways. They were among the first, for example, to commit themselves to get rid of their nuclear weapons. Uh, so as far as I can tell, part of uh, Kazakhstan's interest and the steps that they have taken in participating in the broader world, if you like, uh, is, uh, is compatible with the idea of exercising greater care over their nuclear materials. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Next, please. Yes, um, the, the recently concluded the CSCC meeting that you just mentioned. Right, in Budapest, yes. Um, uh, where the Russian president expressed some concern for the expansion of NATO. Yes. Is, is related to the fact that he's saying the uh, United States is not acting as though um, the Russians are still enemies. My question is, um, do you still perceive the Russians as enemies and isn't there a role for um, the Russians in maintaining balance of power in that region? We certainly do not describe the Russians as enemies or even adversaries. I think the phrase that was used uh, during President Yeltsin's recent visit uh, in late September was strategic partnership. Uh, our view is that there, we certainly have much more in common with democratic Russia uh, than we have uh, differences with them. Uh, that's true on a global basis. It's also true in terms of domestic and economic policy and various other things. Certainly there are going to be differences. I mean, if, if Russia were to interpret or if they were led to believe that the expansion of NATO was at their expense. As I mentioned in my remarks, the idea of moving the barriers, the European barriers, simply farther to the east, of course they would, they would uh, be affronted by that. That is not 
U.S. policy. It is not NATO policy. Uh, it is, I think, at best a misrepresentation uh, of the decision a week or so ago uh, to prepare the way for eventual NATO expansion. Uh, but the, uh, the, I also mentioned, you know, we, our policy is to be inclusive, not exclusive. Uh, the idea is that, you know, Russia can play by the same rules. Uh, there's, there's no reason why Russia needs to feel excluded uh, from the broader security framework uh, which is taking shape in, in Europe. Ma'am. I would like to return to the crime issue. Yes. And, um, being lucky enough, living long enough there, and here I would like to ask you how the United States can help in fight with crime if we cannot solve this problem at all here. Maybe we should exchange program and send Americans to East Europe, or to the ex-East Black, and learn from them how to live without crime. In the former Soviet Union, there was almost no crime, or at least no reported crime. Uh, there are those, of course, who would say that much of what the state did was crime uh, against its citizens. Um, <laughs> I think the key here is we are trying to be as a in, we are trying to be responsive to a need which has been described by the Russians and by other uh, people in the former Soviet Union. It is not to imply that we have all the answers. It is to imply that we may be able to help with some aspects of training, for example, and some aspects of the rule of law, which I described earlier. Um, speaking personally, I don't think that we need to teach the Russians how to be better cops. Uh, it seems to me that this is a technique which uh, over several centuries they have learned uh, very well. Uh, and uh, interrogation techniques is not something that uh, we need to teach them. Uh, on the other hand, we might be able to teach them something about the rights of the accused and, uh, and some things about how uh, interrogations are done and so forth and so forth. Judicial training and a few other things. But I would emphasize also that that we are, we are trying to focus on, first of all, problems, problems that they identify, and second of all, areas where we think there is a direct relevance. For example, the non-proliferation issue, the, the export of nuclear materials, control on that kind of export. That's a crime issue, partly. Um, the uh, attacks on business people, or the possibility of attacks on business people, protection rackets and that sort of thing, including Western business people, American business people. That's a matter of direct interest to us because of our support for what business people do there. So there are areas like that which are directly relevant to U.S. interests, and those are the areas in which we intend to concentrate. But training and facilitation are also a part of it. So I don't suggest that we have all the answers. No, it's not a, we're not a crime-free society, and neither are they. So. To my right. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what the impact of the recent elections in this country are going to be on our foreign aid budget. I'm particularly concerned about Jesse Helms taking over the, the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, and I might say on a personal note, I've been doing some work with AID and I've noticed a, a very dramatic fall in their eagerness to commit funds since the election. Well, I'm, I'm not sure why the latter point would arise, because the programs are certainly going forward. They have been funded uh, for FY95, and there's no prospect that, that that will be changed. We hope and expect that this program will continue to enjoy bipartisan support. Um, it is obvious that Senator Helms uh, is not a great fan of foreign assistance in general. Uh, nor of assistance to Russia and the NIS in particular. Uh, but, you know, his is not the only voice in the U.S. Senate, uh, and uh, nor are all of these programs necessarily going to survive in the same form, regardless of who asks the questions. We expect that the assistance program in this part of the world is going to be of limited duration in the first place. In other words, the, the sunset is out there even at the beginning. Uh, so, yeah, of course we expect that there will be scrutiny of these programs. There should be scrutiny of the programs. Some of them are successful and some of them aren't. My view is that most of them are. 
at least at this stage. But once the utility is, is no longer there, or once they show that they're not succeeding, then we should abolish them, be done with it, uh, and go on to something else where we can help. That's one of the reasons that we are consciously moving now in the direction of support for trade and investment. This is something that began before the elections, it began this last summer, and there was a conscious policy uh, to provide more of the assistance budget to the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, Export-Import Bank, Trade and Development Agencies, because these agencies directly support U.S. business in its activities there. And our view is that in the long run, that's the economic engine that will drive this partnership. Okay. Gentleman to my left. Thank you. Uh, you painted a pretty nice picture of the successes of these programs, and I heard you talk about giving them fuel. Yes. for burning for winter fuel. A friend of mine visited Lithuania a year or so ago, and his specialty is fuel burners. And he was absolutely appalled at the inefficient technology that they have for burning fuels. Yes. So it sounds like we're giving them fuel to burn inefficiently. And Not my, there. No, no. no and no. one of my um, questions is, uh, can they afford a green ethic? Are we going to see a, a vast environmental degradation at the cost of accelerated economic growth in all of those countries? On the first point, uh, our program in Lithuania and in a lot of other places uh, on energy efficiency has to do specifically with addressing the point you raised, that is inefficient burners, tremendous waste, you know, people leaving the windows open. The way you keep an apartment cool in Moscow in the old days was by opening the window. A window. Uh, because they're all overheated uh, in the wintertime. So, you know, tremendous waste. Um, Lithuania actually has made some very significant progress in that regard, mostly driven by real prices. Uh, for the past year or so, people have had to pay real prices for, for their energy. It's no longer subsidized. Uh, and uh, that makes people real efficient, real quick. Uh, and uh, so, anyway, I think that the, the cases that I was citing, by the way, are those that have mostly been involved in uh, conflict, for example, Armenia, Azerbaijan, those are the main ones uh, where we still have uh, fuel supply issues. And it is, it is very much needed, there's no question about that, because of supply disruptions elsewhere. Gentleman to my right. There uh, clearly is a lot of local activity. Uh, <coughs> University of Maryland faculty are, are teaching in the Russian Far East, and yes. uh, St. Petersburg planners have visited Harbor Place to study it, and international Orthodox uh, Christian Charities, uh, based here in Baltimore, is, is doing humanitarian aid. Right. But could you characterize Maryland uh, relative to other states in its response to the challenges of <laughs> NIS development? I was afraid somebody might ask that. Um, <laughs> actually, I, I wouldn't try. But I will say that, that uh, my experience in this region, including specifically Maryland, in this case, my experience goes back to my China days more than it does to NIS days, uh, is that Maryland has been in the forefront of these people-to-people uh, -people programs, of the outreach programs, of educational exchanges, and so forth. I assume that the same is true in the NIS. I have not seen breakdowns, for example, by how many exchange students are there in Maryland versus Kansas versus Oregon or something like that. I haven't seen those kinds of breakdowns, but I, I am virtually certain that Maryland is in the forefront of, uh, of this process. Next, please. Sir. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Johnson, I had a, an open-ended question for you, so you can take it in any direction you'd like. Um, I've recently returned from Moscow on a, on a two-week um, two business trip um, in search of some um, new technology available in, in medium and high-tech uh, development, primary research, et cetera. And some of the, some of the concerns that I've, I've heard from people that I have talked to there in Russia, um, businessmen that have been there multiple times and have come back, and one man on the plane was, had, had cut his trip short a week because he was unable to get funds out um, there were a series of additional um, sort of, um, how will I say it, just uh, someone would say, I'm sorry, you have to have a special account, and then he would get the special account, and he says, oh, but there's an additional fee for that special account, and there were just layer upon layer of additional legislation that seemed to be very frustrating. Right. So my question to you is, um, what has to happen in Russia, and when? Um, in order to encourage additional U.S. investment from both private 
and government sectors, and indeed to preserve the present rate of investment, the issues at hand to be successful there deal more than with cross-cultural and economic concerns, certainly, and by inference, I refer to the fluid nature of the pertinent legislation at the Duma, and which seems uh, to almost aid and abet, and dare I say it, uh, inconsistent practices of, uh, of, of getting business going. So what climate, what climate per se, what, would, you, would you take a moment to describe a series of events that uh, could encourage a more standardized business environment, and standardized business environment taken in Western terms? Thank you. There are three or four key points which we consistently hear from U.S. business people which are impediments to their willingness to do business in the NIS. Those three or four are, first of all, laws which are open and consistent. I think you used the word consistent or inconsistent. Openly arrived at and consistently applied. <laughs> Second, banking. Uh, the whole question about how money is handled. Uh, for, for those of you who have been there, uh, it is eye-opening, it still is eye-opening, to imagine how antiquated this system is. You, but to, to understand it, you have to understand that banks were not banks in the way that we thought of them. They were instruments for allocating central government resources. So whether it was the Ag Bank or the so-called Commercial Bank or Savings Bank or anything like that, they would be told by Moscow how much they were to provide to X enterprise, you know, let's say a fertilizer plant or something like that, or lumber mill. Whether the lumber mill ever paid them back or not, or whether the lumber mill ever, you know, had a balance sheet was irrelevant. So. One of the institutions which I am very encouraged about because of its success in Eastern Europe, which is now underway, is the Russian American Enterprise Fund. The Russian American Enterprise Fund has a funding level of, I believe, $340 million over a three-year period. Now, they haven't come close to spending the first-year allocation, and it's very likely that this will be spread out over a somewhat longer time. But what they are trying to do, basically, and what a similar enterprise fund did in Poland and in Hungary and in the Czech Republic and now in the Baltics, uh, is to set up something that you and I would recognize as a banking system, whereby there is a loan officer who actually looks at enterprises and looks at the capacity to pay and looks at the capacity to generate income and so forth. Um, and then these um, uh, funds, these instruments, if you like, become kind of training grounds also for uh, a new generation of, of bankers in Russia or the Baltics or the other countries that I mentioned. Um, so uh, banking is for sure a major obstacle. The third one, I would say, is taxes. Uh, because uh, much as we all love taxes, uh, what we love even worse is unpredictability. Uh, and for most of the companies who are doing business in that area, there is a very high element of unpredictability. Even if you can get something that is called a tax rate, it doesn't mean that that's what you're going to be paying. Uh, so, you know, the taxation system and the, and the, the business of sort of fiscal management, if you like, uh, is, is uh, one of the areas in which we're working with them, but it's a long way from being solved. And the fourth, and I suppose the most important point, is bureaucratic behavior. Uh, the, the question of how institutions work, uh, whether it's the Ministry of Finance, whether it's the Customs Office, whether it's the, you know, whoever else, I mean the cop on the beat or the postman, something like that. Um, how these people work as parts of institutions uh, is at this point very much up in the air. Uh, and it's for that reason that you get the stories that you describe, accurately described, as uh, fickle behavior. You know, you, you get one permit and then you have to get another permit and then you have to get another permit and you have to, you know, at least you're asked to pay somebody off and so forth. So uh, it is a very um, a discouraging process. The other side of that, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to paint you a rosy picture here, I, but I would say that the other side of it is that there has been over the past half year something in the neighborhood of 500 million U.S. dollars a month flowing into Russia. So they're doing something right. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it's the order of magnitude is such that 
it has to be responding to changed circumstances. And that means lower inflation, it means somewhat more predictable uh, currency uh, behavior, uh, it means somewhat more predictable contract behavior, and so forth. Uh, so this 500 million, by the way, is not all U.S., but most of it is. Actually, the U.S. is so far the biggest outside investor in Russia, as it is in Poland. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's not a hopeless picture. It's a difficult picture, but it's not a hopeless one. Rebecca? Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, along with the decentralization and privatization of banks that yes. you just mentioned, there's also um, coming in the newly independent states the privatization of apartments and other buildings, right. along with um, a policy in some governments, for example, in the Ukraine, to return buildings, religious buildings and such synagogues or churches, right. which were originally <laughs> held by religious groups um, taken over by the government to be returned to those um, religious or other minority groups. Is there something that the United States can do to encourage that? And if so, what? We encourage it in two regards. First of all, the sort of system of justice, if you like, that is a system of laws and restitution and so forth. We, we have been involved in some places uh, in helping to formulate land laws and transfer of ownership laws. Uh, the bigger question, and one which is nowhere near to being resolved in any of the uh, 12 NIS countries, I'm now specifically exempting you know, all the others in Eastern Europe, uh, is land privatization, that is land ownership. Uh, for institutions like those you mentioned, there is, in many cases, a history of ownership that predates World War II before they were nationalized. So in those cases, actually, the, the process has, again, it's difficult but not impossible. I mean, there are places, there are a lot of places now, in, in Kiev, for example, where, where uh, the, the churches and uh, I think the synagogues also have uh, managed to reclaim uh, land. But for individuals, that is actually having a plot of land that you can call your own in the countryside, that is a very difficult question. Uh, and it's one, frankly, that most of them haven't come close to approaching. We deal with it. I mean, we talk to them about it, and we say that, it's, that land ownership obviously is a, is a birthright in this country. Uh, and it's, uh, it's one of those things which will generate spontaneous economic development. But it is a very hard sell, frankly. Um, and uh, it's really one of those things we deal with more in the context of broader privatization and macroeconomic restructuring. Sir? Yes. yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Ambassador. Gregory Chanel at Johns Hopkins University. With the potential for uh, p political and economic upheaval in the region, do we have assurances that the remaining nuclear uh, devices are secure? And do you have any other recommendations for the security of nuclear material besides aid with crime? Uh, we do have such assurances, yes. Uh, and we have had for some time from all four of the countries in which nuclear weapons uh, remain after the demise of the Soviet Union. Um, one of the programs which I didn't mention but should have uh, is, the, is what we call the Nunlugar program, uh, which specifically addresses the question of this safe and secure storage of nuclear materials, dismantling, um, and so forth. Uh, in other words, getting rid of those things. We are involved in that program in those four countries. Uh, and it is, it is going forward. Uh, it's, a, it's a quite large program. The exact sum that has been appropriated, I'm not sure, I think it's about a billion point one or something like that, dollars for the Nunlugar program throughout the uh, former, so if, well, that's those four countries. Ukraine is 350 million, I know. Ukraine alone is 350. Um, and uh, that doesn't count the other three. So uh, it's a big program. It is going forward. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, it's succeeding. Uh, I, I'm not aware that the military, military controlled um, in installations have been the source of the leakage which has been uh, on the news over the past many months. Most of the, as far as I know, every case has involved a research facility or something else and very small quantities. So. Thank you, sir. I, d I don't mean to suggest that this is not a worrisome problem. Let me just reiterate the point. It is a very worrisome problem. The controls are obviously uh, a matter of great concern to us. We are working on it. But I'm not aware at this point that there has been uh, any leakage of militarily significant materials. Sir? Yes. A very well-known economist by the name of Friedrich Hayek wrote a well-known book, Road to Thriftdom, 
in which he labeled socialism as the fatal conceit. <laughs> and I think events have proved him right. But in this country, we have had many, many scholars devoting their lives to a study of the Soviet Union. We have a central intelligence agency which devoted huge resources to a study of the Soviet Union. But it is my impression that the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rapidity with which it occurred, I think, took most people quite by surprise. And I wonder, retrospectively, if you could identify, perhaps from your experience, the two or three factors that might have brought this collapse abroad about. Sure. Uh, I appreciate that's a big question, and I appreciate that there has much, been much written on it, but perhaps based on your experience, would you identify two or three factors that you feel led to the collapse of the Soviet Union? Sure. Thank you. I'll try not to answer it uh, you know, in as much uh, detail as I would like, because it is a very good question, and it's one of really major historic significance. I think, by the way, that this TV program that I mentioned earlier will provide different kinds of insights. Uh, and therefore, I think, more revealing insights now about how sick uh, the Soviet Union was in its last days. Um, two specific examples, if I may. Um, June 4, 1989, the Polish people, roughly 90 percent, slightly under 90 percent of the eligible voters turned out in a newly created Senate of 100 seats, 99 of the Solidarity candidates won, and one non-communist farmer won. In the lower house of the parliament, where there was already a, a prearranged um, cooking, if you like, of the proportions, the Solidarity candidates won all of the seats for which they ran, 35 percent of the lower house. That election unmistakably and unequivocally spelled the end of communist rule in that country. My view is that it also spelled the end of communist rule in Eastern Europe and by extension in the Soviet Union. It is perhaps true that people in general were surprised at the rapidity with which the Soviet Union collapsed. I think those of us who were there at the time and who also saw the demonstrations in the Baltic states, for example, where people held hands from Finland to the Polish border, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people out there. This was two years before the end of the Soviet Union, uh, demonstrating for sovereignty, demonstrating for the right to rule themselves. Uh, these were very clear signals. And it's possible that you know some people didn't see them. I wasn't reading CIA reports at the time, but my sense is that the CIA analysis has generally been pretty good uh, about these kinds of apocalyptic changes, if you like. The other. Um, the other event, I guess, is, is uh, in a sense smaller, um, but it was the precipitating event, and that was the coup against Gorbachev on August 18, 1991. Um, maybe something like that would have happened anyway, but that sure did speed up the process. Uh, it was not coincidental that our recognition and our establishment of missions in the Baltics occurred two weeks later. Uh, it is not a coincidence, I think, that by Christmas of the same year, that is to say four or so months later, uh, the whole apparatus had collapsed because it lacked legitimacy, people in high places were shooting at each other, uh, and so forth. I mean, the, the right to rule, if you like, had, had evaporated, and, and the at least passive will of the governed to allow themselves to be governed had evaporated. So I would, I would point to those two things, and I don't think that they were a total surprise. In fact, I look back at a letter a Christmas letter that I wrote in 1988, uh, it was actually the first week of 89, in which I referred to the end of the Cold War. Uh, because already at that time, the roundtable process in Poland was going forward. And that, once you have the will of the government, once you have free elections, a system like that which had been imposed for 50 or more years could not survive. It couldn't survive because the will of the people was never there. Uh, Sir. Good afternoon, Ambassador Johnson. I'd like to switch gears for a moment. Uh, in your presentation, you alluded to the fact that there's a possibility that NATO may expand and <laughs> other countries, uh, possibly in particular the Soviet Union. 
uh, may be seeking membership. Uh, my question to you is, would you speak to the fact uh, or to the aspect of the future of NATO uh, being uh, that the Soviet threat is no longer uh, one that Europe has to co be concerned with? And also, do you see that the potential in the general agreement on tariffs and trades might play a part in the demise of, of NATO? On the first point, I hope I didn't say that I think Russia is seeking NATO membership because so far as I know, they have not so indicated. They are, they have indicated an interest in participation and partnership for peace. And as I understand at the Brussels meeting a few days ago, uh, Foreign Minister Kozarev uh, refused to take the next step of actually presenting their plan. But they have already indicated their interest in participating in partnership for peace. I think that's a fairly long step away from a demonstrated interest in becoming a NATO member. Our policy, however, is that if they want to be a member on the same terms as everybody else, we would welcome that possibility, provided that it meets, you know, with the, with the acceptance of everybody else. All the other members have to agree. But in principle, uh, if, if Russia were prepared to live by the same rules that everybody else is prepared to live by, we would certainly consider that, that uh, possibility. It's by no means a certainty. Uh, on the question of GATT, um, I guess I'm not sure that I see a connection between GATT accession and NATO as an institution. Um, the, the objective, of course, with GATT is to lower tariffs and thereby to enhance trade, uh, to remove the kind of barriers uh, in European trade, for example, which uh, we have been concerned about uh, through the EU uh, and in the case of Japan and other countries which are major trading partners. Um, I, I guess I don't see that GATT has a security dimension, uh, except as those countries are healthy, uh, as, as to the degree that they are healthy economies. It seems to me that GATT helps uh, trade. It helps everybody. It helps our economy. It helps theirs. Uh, and NATO should also help our security posture in Europe. Thank you.